Let us pray again. Dear Heavenly Father, as we transition from worshiping you through singing your praises to worshiping you through attentiveness to your word, would you help us to be clear of any distractions and really focus on you the way you deserve? We desire, and even if maybe we feel hesitant in saying this, I know I certainly do, but I hope this is everyone's prayer. We desire for you to transform us by the renewing of our minds in this moment. And for those little tugs of doubt, Lord, like the person prays in, in the Gospels, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Make that prayer of transforming our minds more true. Help us to have deeper love for your word. Help us to understand it accurately and apply it earnestly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to begin with a little bit of a review. We're going to finish up James today, not just chapter 5, but the entire book. I love the book of James. It's been uh, very direct, very blunt. I love how the Holy Spirit will use people in a way that you can tell their personality. He doesn't erase us. He doesn't make us robots. Uh, He uses the personality that God had created in James. And James can be very straightforward, we'll say. And James had just issued a strong warning of coming judgment to a group of folks. We realized it wasn't all rich folks, but rich folks in that day and age who were abusing people. And given the current state of their world, and really in parallel to the current state of our world, with lots of, lots of issues and lots of injustices that people could visibly see and were drawing, drawing their attention to, he said the following, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Let me pause here. This almost sounds dyslexic in English. It almost sounds like Yoda is saying it. And the NASB will stick sometimes to the Greek order of words really closely. And so I want to make sure that you understand he is telling you, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. And he's saying, brothers, listen, that's what he's saying. So it's a little out of order in English. It's a little different than maybe the way we think. But the idea there is to look at the prophets, the people in the Old Testament is who he has in mind. And he's not even just talking about the office of prophet because he's not going to mention Samuel or one of the great prophets or minor prophets. He's actually going to mention somebody else who God used and spoke through and used as an example to us. And so he is speaking of prophets as in those whom God used in the Bible. And we can certainly learn from the example in the Old Testament as well as the New. And we can tell he means that by who he gives as an example in this next verse. James 5, 11, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Now, if you read the beginning of the book of Job, you might not think that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But thankfully, as Job endured all the hardship that he had and even came face to face with God and had to ultimately admit that he did not know how things really worked, he had to face humility, which is really the beginning and one of the most important lessons of the Bible, is to approach God, approach life with humility, understanding you don't have all the answers, But in the end, after all that, we see that Job was blessed and everything was doubled what he originally had. And you might, careful readers might have noted, well, wait, it says he has the same amount of kids at the beginning and the end. Well, he could see those kids again, so his total kids that he would have in eternity would be, um, you know, it would be doubled. But I wanted to pause here and, and look at this word endurance before we get into the main body of today's message, which really is focusing on prayer and the appropriateness of it and the need for it. But endurance is so important. Endurance is used, the word that's translated endurance here is used 18 times in the New Testament. And here it actually connects back earlier into James chapter 1. So I I don't have a slide for it, but if you just remember back in starting in verse 2 of James chapter 1, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, 
And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So James begins with this idea of, hey, the hard things in your life, it's like you're an athlete. If you practice really hard, you're going to be stronger in the game. If you stretch yourself, it's going to be better for you and healthier for you. It's going to develop the muscles of spiritual discipline in you as you use them, even in the midst of hard trial. He's connecting that idea, and it's almost a book in. He's got more to say, but he's bringing it back, and he's giving you an example in Job. And really, this theme of endurance is important throughout, throughout the Bible, but certainly in the New Testament, there are key passages that you would probably remember, even if you, you know, don't have every you know, address, you know, that's the chapter and verse, you don't have every address memorized. As I say a few of these, you're going to go, oh yes, this sounds very familiar. Luke 21 records Jesus saying, starting in verse 17, and you will be hated by all people because of my name. You don't hear that one in the Bible promise books or, or in the name it, claim it crowd very much, but it's important because that's connected with endurance. There is, there are obstacles on our way, and many of them, if we're walking with Christ, will come because we're following him and not the world. But he goes on to say, yet not a, pa- not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Their endurance. And he says lives. Let's put that in the context of Jesus' teaching. How do we get our lives? How do we gain our lives? By losing them. He's not talking about, you know, you're going to save yourself in this life. He's talking about eternal life. Eternal life involves endurance. Hebrews 12.1 calls us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so James is continuing this idea that's throughout the New Testament. Romans uses it four times and connects it with our hope. Our life can sometimes be difficult. Now, I hope that I don't err and and focus on this too much because there is times in our life that is joyous and we want to spread that joy and we want to share it with others. And there is joy to be had not connected to our moment. But especially in light of COVID and the wildfires and being in in a partially burnt down home this week, this, this really resonates with me, and I wanted to pause and just do this, because so often we hear, even inside the church, about how great life can be, and sometimes young Christians, they sign up, you know, they sign on the dotted line, they become a member of the church, and then the first time a hardship happens, they go, wait a minute, whoa, I didn't sign up for this. I thought the Lord was going to bless me, and everything was going to be awesome now that I had Jesus. That is not how it works out. That is not how it worked out for the early church followers, of the early church leaders. That is not how it works out for us today. That is not actually how Jesus said it would work out. We have our hope in him. We are not citizens of this world. And in a very real sense, we are just pilgrims passing through. And in our moments of sadness we, and, and difficulty, you know, maybe if you use that pilgrim language, if, you know, we had a long ride or, you know, our wagon is down or whatever, when we're at the the kind of the fire at the end of the night, and we gather around, we say, hey, it was a hard day, but we're almost there. We're getting there. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to encourage one another, and we are supposed to work forward and push past our difficulties. Now, there's lots of theological issues around um, people who endure and people who don't. Jesus and Matthew connects endurance to those that bear fruit on the parable of the soils that you know it was good soil and they bore fruit and we don't i can't tell you for sure if somebody who we might call a fair weather christian is saved or not i don't know if that means when they depart that they weren't really among us or if they're just going through a trial and they're going to come back god knows all those details but i can tell you that i know that i'm supposed to pray for them but the idea that You could just sign your name on a dotted line, get dunked in water, and things like that, and then you were okay spiritually. It's not really what it is in the New Testament. And as I grew up in a denomination that really emphasized membership and baptism and and those kinds of things, as I explored out and went into different denominations, I would occasionally encounter people push back and say, too many people in your church get their name on a dotted line and think that they're saved and then only show up at Christmas and Easter and have no real relationship with Jesus. And You know, they had a valid point sometimes. Jesus is not to be treated as some kind of fire insurance, as some kind of just-in-case plan. There is this word called abiding that the New Testament uses in many translations. I've taken that, and really the modern version is, is active. So if I define faith for you in a biblical manner... I, 
I believe biblical faith is an active trust based on evidence. It's not based on what we don't know. That's the world's idea of faith, right? Hebrews says it's the evidence of things unseen. David knew that he could tackle Goliath not because he was crazy and thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to run and maybe I'll make it with a giant. He had the boldness there because he trusted and said, God got me through the lion and the bear. I know God delivered my people. I know God is a good God. I know this is right. I'm pushing forward. It's based on what we know, not what we don't know. But faith must be abiding, that is. It must be active. That means that we pray whether we feel like it or not, and that's going to become important later. That means that we continue on our faith whether the world is crazy or not. And unfortunately, sometimes in the midst of things, when the world pushes and pressures and things like that, some people will fold and go, well, I guess I'll side with the world. Now, they don't usually make it, that decision. They usually find some excuse or they try to justify it in some way or something along those lines. Or maybe, you know, they just, "Mm, I won't do that. Or I'm not like those Christians or or whatever. But we do find some that, that don't abide. And I want to encourage you that abiding is the right thing to do, and you're going to need to do it. When the world gets tough and you're very much tempted to curse God, and, and, you know, Job's wife, Job's wife encouraged him to just curse God and die. Uh, not, not the best spouse relationship. When you are feeling that that's the way to do, like it's to give up, that is the time that it's even more important to abide, to continue in Jesus, to continue the trust, and to hold on, this is short, this is hard, Maybe even count your blessings and go, God got me through X, Y, and Z. He's a big God. He's got this too. So James, as he's moving towards prayer, because prayer is going to be an important part of that abiding, we're going to need continued constant communication. Can you imagine thinking, I'm staying in a relationship with my spouse. I mean, we don't live in the same house or even the same earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no so that you may not fall under judgment. So you can't swear by heaven or earth. Of course, we know that heaven's God's throne, earth is God's footstool. You don't own them. But did you catch that? As he's wrapping up his book, he says, above all. This is something he puts a lot of emphasis on, right? He was chiefly wanting them not to do this. Now, he didn't mean swear in the modern sense. Now, please don't. I'm not encouraging you to cuss like a sailor, okay? But I'm also not condemning you if something falls on your foot and you say a bad word, right? Uh, confess, confess your sins before God, and sometimes words like that, you know, they come out. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about swearing an oath or swearing a vow. And he didn't mean all legal oaths. Now, we've talked about this before, so I'm not going to redo this. I know maybe it's been a year. But Jesus even, when he was at his own trial, was put under a type of legal oath. So he's not talking about that. He's talking about something uh, more in line with that last section. And Jesus said it this way, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. The Jewish people to whom James was writing was very aware of taking inappropriate oaths and the dangers thereof it. So Ecclesiastes 5.5 says, it is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. And there are examples of people taking vows and then it coming back to bite them. And we're going to, the next book we'll go through is Judges, and we're going to get to one of those examples when we get there. There'll be a couple of weeks, you know, we're going to talk about some other things kind of topically in between there, but then we're going to go to Judges, and we're going to see some of those examples where people took vows that they should not have and then had to pay for it. But you don't really own anything, so you should not be vowing on heaven and earth. Now, you might be tempted to go, I own stuff. I drove in a car here. I own the car. Maybe the bank owns the car. Let me demonstrate my point to you a different way. So there was a scientist in a lab, and he was working, and he was, he was convinced that he could create life. And then therefore, he thought, if I can create life, I would be just like God. Maybe he believes in panspermia, like Richard Dawkins, if you know that, that aliens made us, right? That's, that's a real belief that some, some atheists hold. Of course, then you've got to ask them, and I would always do that. Well, then who made them? You still need your ultimate source. You've just moved the problem back one. But we've had at least five Jurassic Park movies to tell us that Uh, creating life in a lab is usually a bad idea. So he goes forward with it, and he boldly declares out loud his plan. And then he hears a voice that says, go ahead. Emboldened, not not responding with, oh no, but emboldened, he, he says, if that's you, God, you made man and I can do it too. 
and I'm going to start with dirt, just like you. So he scoops up some dirt, and then he hears a voice that says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, get your own dirt. You see, the building blocks of this world weren't made by you. You can't own the things that you own because you didn't make them. You don't actively sustain them, right? The more we understand about physics, this universe is, is actively sustained. It's led some interesting people to think that we're like a projection, like we're in the matrix. Well, we're not projected in the matrix. It's, not a, it's God that's sustaining us. It actually matches with Scripture. He's sustaining all of the universe. It's almost like, and this is a metaphor here, so it's not perfect, but it's almost like the universe is like the music and God is like the band playing the music. But of course we have freedom inside of that, but we need Him to continue to exist. And guess what? All that stuff that we own, what happens when we die? We're actually, we think of ourselves as material creatures and we're in material bodies, but we are actually spiritually cre- spiritual creatures at our core. Now, the body isn't inherently bad, right? It's been corrupted, but it's not inherently bad. We're going to get new bodies in heaven, but we are eternal creatures, and the stuff that we think we own are temporal. It would be really weird to say that you own something that you rented. Remember when Blockbuster was a thing? That's not a thing anymore, I think. But uh, it would be really weird. I own this for one day. Well, it's not really owning it, is it? That's temporary. All your stuff is temporary. Now, what happens if you make a vow or an oath on something that you don't really own? What happens if you walk into a casino, and please don't, it is not a wise use of your money, and gambling is not a, is not a good use of a Christian's time. I, I think lots of gambling is sinful. I know some of, you know, I'm not telling you you can't play a game of cards or something, okay? I'm not trying to be a legalist, right? I've known people who said, you can't even play spades at home for, for quarters, okay? That may be taken a little bit far. But, but say you do walk in. And you, you place a bet and you lose. But the thing you put on the table was a set of keys to somebody else's car. How are you going to pay? That ain't really your car. So James is warning, don't try to cash checks for stuff that you don't actually own. Because you might find that things are going to come due and you're going to have to pay some way. But it won't be with what is God's stuff if you got yourself into that. And I think it's also a warning for us as an indicator for how we deal with other people. Many people have a baloney detector. I had to think of a good way to say this without getting in trouble. A baloney detector so that they could detect kind of phony things. If someone is, and I don't don't misunderstand me. I'm using this as an example. I'm not trying to take God's name in vain. If somebody constantly says, well, I swear to God that I will do this. I swear to be very leery. I think it's a lot like Shakespeare, and this is my favorite quote. I know I'm a hillbilly, and sometimes I say this a little wrong because I always read Shakespeare instead of actually um, watching a play. Uh, You know, when you're a hillbilly in public school in Kentucky, you can't really go and see Shakespeare plays, so they made us read the plays. But um, I think thou doeth protest too much. Sometimes there is a character flaw that you can catch, and I want you to catch this for your own safety so you don't get tricked where people are swearing by things and making a big deal of how firm their promise is. Well, why do they need to do that? Sometimes it's because they know deep down inside that it is not really a firm promise and they don't really mean that. So instead, just both for yourself and for the people that you do business with and go around, look for people who are just consistently telling you what they're going to do and then doing it and keeping their word, being consistent. It is a wonderful witness to all the people around. It's what we could, might call somebody as trustworthy. We want people to think of Christians as trustworthy people because we're telling them something that many of them have a hard time believing with, that there's an eternal life, that there's a heaven to be gained and a hell to lose, or, or a hell to spend eternity in. We, if we're going to be serious about that, we need them to trust us in everything. We need them to see that we are We have good reasons for what we say and that we keep our word. Because unfortunately, they shouldn't, but unfortunately, the reality is is they will use our mistakes or any lie by us as a reason to reject Christ. They shouldn't, but they will use it as an excuse. Let's continue on and let's focus on prayer for a bit. Especially with that heavy weight, maybe we need some prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. 
Romans 12, 15 was the first verse that came to mind. It's very similar, uh, at least in, in my eyes. It says, Rejoice with those who re- rejoice and weep with those who weep. So if there's anyone among you and they're suffering, well, then it should be a plural activity. And if there's anyone that is, that is uh, rejoicing, that should be a plural activity. Uh, by that I mean we're a community. Things should be done together. And you know that there is something to this. You know that when you see your little kid running at you with a big smile on their face, arms wide open for a hug, it doesn't matter how bad your day is. It just got a lot better, at least for me. I mean, even a puppy, you know, a little puppy wagging its tail, you know, that, that brightens you. Joy is something that is contagious. And so is dealing with sorrowfulness or pain. And sometimes when you're sorrowful, you don't want to pray. Remember, Job's, Job's wife said, just curse God and God, die, right? Not, not a, what we would call a healthy marriage. They needed some marriage counseling, okay? But sometimes you are tempted to just give up. Pray when you don't feel like it, even if you are suffering. I hope you are not having the kind of relationship that God that some people might have with their parents. And unfortunately, this, this does happen where you only show up and talk to them when you need money or when you need something, right? The parent, hey, I need rent, dad, could you uh, help me out? Or I need money to go to the movies. Or There is a time in a lot of teenagers and young adults' life where that is true, and hopefully people grow past that. And then they understand. Usually the joke is that from 18 to 25, parents get so much smarter than they were. Of course, they they are not so much the ones that's changed. It's the the young adult that has matured. But keep that in mind. We need to continue in endurance and pray with suffering. But also we need to make sure that we are encouraging each other to pray when we're suffering. I have a little cat. You know I love my cat. Her name is Maxie. I didn't name her. My brother named her. It was supposed to be his cat. My cat, unfortunately, had, um, had, had passed away, and then I ended up with his cat. And I've had her for like 15 years now, so she, I, she's very clear, and she knows that she was here first, even before the wife. And she was with me in my bachelor pad, and she knows that. But she at least accepts the wife now. Uh, she accepts Heather and loves Heather and things like that, and she accepts the kids. But she knows, she thinks that I'm hers, and she will climb on me in my sleep sometimes, and I can feel that little paw. Now, my cat, if you've never seen her, is incredibly fat, right? Now, we're talking Garfield fat, and she's gotten a little better at the moment. We've got, with Judy's help, we've got her on a diet, and that's helped a little bit because she hurt her back, (laughs) so we had to help her out, but she has these little paws, just four paws, and sometimes she can exert so much pressure on that one paw that it can hurt as she climbs. It'll wake you up, you know, step on your kidney, you know, she stepped on my kidney when I had a kidney stone one time, and I lay on, ooh, not, not good, right? But if she lays down with her whole weight, then it doesn't hurt anymore, because one pinpoint can exert more than that one tiny area. You need to spread out the pressure. That's how people set on beds of nails. If you put pressure on one nail, bam, you're going to get it pierced through, whatever you're, you're using to put pressure on there. But if instead the pressure is Uh, spread out amongst many nails, people can lay down very carefully on a bed of nails. Please don't do that, okay? I I need a a little sign I can throw up that don't try this at home that I can throw up there. Don't try that at home. But do try to spread the pressure of the hardness of this life and share it with one another. If we see someone hurting, let's hurt with them. And you know what? There's something that supernaturally that happens that a little bit of that pain is taken away. Because James has pointed out earlier, prayer needs to be more than just, hey, I pray for you. We need to also meet their needs. Some prayers need hands and feet. And so as we pray for them, let's listen. Let's take a little bit of that burden. And you know what? If we do that together, something else will happen too. We also take a little bit of each other's joy or share it. And the great thing about joy is, as we sing, as we see people sing, I can think of seeing Katie up here in the choir sometimes singing with just a super smiling face like she has right now, and it just brings joy to my heart. Even if I'm a little distracted, even if I'm a little stressed out, just seeing how excited she is in worship excites me for worship. And so we should do that together as a community. But James has more to say say about prayer. In James 5.14, And this is often what we think about prayer. We think about taking our needs to God. It should also be that we're praising God. But today we are going to look at this because this is a big big chunk of what James is addressing here because he's wanting to give orders for how this should be done inside the church. 
Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. You'll notice that there's some, uh, if you don't know Greek, you won't get the, uh, the particular word for sick, but think bedridden. But look, pray over, and then even here we're going to see another word that hints kind of a, at a, a picture that James is using. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. So there's this picture of somebody who's bedridden. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Notice there, there's an if. Okay, I'll, I'll come back after I finish this. I know I'm, I'm in interjecting a lot of commentary. I don't have the patience to wait, but I want you to catch this while we're in the verse so you don't think I'm adding it on. It's right there in the verse. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much, or as I learned it in the good old King James, availeth much. I don't even know what availeth means, but I remember that verse. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but myself, the rest of the staff, Uh, The elders that serve here, uh, yes, many of us have various giftings and we work together to serve you and we serve others in the community, but you know what? I'm not aware of one of us that has the gift of being psychic. I've not met one of us who consistently can read minds, right? And we are broken and fallen human beings. And James knew this. That was the same way for the elders and leaders back in the church then. And so he knew that situations arose no doubt like one I have to share with you. Now, it's been a couple of years. It's not anyone here, okay? But I one time was, I, I got a call from somebody and they kind of complained, I've been sick and no one in the church has called and checked on me. And they were a little upset. And as we continued in the conversation, they also said, oh, also I need to give you my new number. Light bulb went off in my head. How long have you had this number? Oh, two or three months now. How long have you been upset that no one's been calling you? the church. Oh, two or three months now. Did you give anyone in the church your new number? Oh, I guess I have not. We couldn't psychically, you know, find that new number, right? We weren't going door to door and checking, you know, and and there's lots of people to care for. You know, sometimes my heart breaks because there are are needs that I, I, I want to get to people, and I run out of time. And this is a, you know, a fairly small church, and considering, you know, I have family members that attend massive churches, and I, and I can recall one instance where a family member was really upset that her pastor did not come and see her in the hospital. Well, I asked some more questions, you know, assistant pastor came, a Sunday school teacher came, and whatever. Well, how many of you in your church anyways? Well, only 2,000. <laughs> he probably just didn't have the time to get to you. That doesn't mean he didn't love you. It doesn't mean he wasn't praying for you. It's just that we can't, we're not superhuman beings. And so James lays this out, especially those that are bedridden, that are really bad. You know, we have to make priorities. Make sure that you get the word to the elders. So guys, the responsibility is on you. I am happy to come to you. Chuck, Chuck is great at this. Carrie is great at this. And we're, we're training up Kevin. And he's got some concerns. I was happy to see him, you know, pull somebody aside and just chatting away with somebody. It, we are, we're busy but we will make time for you. That's what we are. We're servants, right? We're happy to do that, but we cannot do that if you don't tell us there's a need. And you know what? I've been guilty of this too. Sometimes I've been too worried about taking care of other people that I have kept my mouth shut when I've been in serious need of prayer and when I've been really upset or really stressed out, and I don't want to share that, and I don't want to be honest about it, and I don't want people to worry about me. And if I'm not careful, I can be tempted to think, well, nobody asked me about anything, Hey, wait a minute. That's not how the Bible says that's supposed to work. I don't, we're not all supposed to be going around, you know, when people, when people ask, how are you doing today? Most of them don't really mean how are you are doing today. And, and culturally, we do this thing where we say, oh, I'm great, even if we're not. We shouldn't do that, by the way. But we need to be direct when we have a need and be clear and say, I, I need prayer. Here's why. Right? And so we confess that. And if there is sin, note that if. All sickness is not related to sin. We see this somewhere, uh, sometimes inside the church. I've seen this. I've had personal friends who have had lifelong illnesses get accused that they didn't have enough faith or that they needed to clean up their life. And I'm like, this person, they've got their Christian walk way better than me. They're living an example in, in intense pain. Why would anyone say such a hurtful thing? It's if 
Sometimes the sicknesses are allowed, Jesus addresses this in the Gospels, for the glory of God. Or we don't know exactly the fine details here, but we'll see it later. We'll find out the answer. But if there is sin, that can cause an issue. So, if there is, confess it. Right? And don't take offense if somebody asks, hey, I've got this going on in my life, and they say, you know, is there anything you need to talk about? You know, maybe they're going to do it in a nice uh, ambassador-style way to give you the opportunity. But really, oftentimes, sin is just the result, or sickness is just the result that we live in a fallen world. And it may not be our sin that causes the problem. We may be sick because of somebody else's sin. We may be hurt because of somebody else's sin. We may be hurt because a drunk ran a red light, caused a car crash. Or we, those sins impact other people and they have ripple effects. But do pray. And then he also says that they are to anoint with oil. And actually, I'll pause and I'll look down. Here it is. We keep, now I grew up Baptist, so this is like super Pentecostal for me in comparison to the way I originally grew up. But this is biblical. And, and, and it was funny, it was a Baptist pastor who said, I was shamed one day when they walked up to me and said, I want you to anoint me with oil and pray around the elders because I have this need. And here's this verse. And he said, we didn't have a drop of oil in the entire church. And at that point forward, he always kept oil in the pulpit. And I really appreciated his lesson and his honesty that that wasn't something that they were doing well, and he knew that he needed to change. But we do that as an obedience thing to Christ, but do know it doesn't say that the oil will cure them, right? Or that the elders, that they have some kind of superpower. Sometimes there is a gifted feeling. Sometimes, I know I mentioned we're not psychic, there was a time that I knew somebody was cutting without God told me. I took somebody to church once as a, as a guest, and I wasn't the one preaching that day. I was pretty young, and I was a youth leader at the time. The guy preaching uh, was a guest preacher, and he stopped, and he said, there's someone here among you that has this, and he names off this condition. And this person that I had brought to church, I didn't know this, they had that condition. And so God spoke that into their heart, into their mind, just like he had with me with that one that was cutting, and sometimes that happens. I think sometimes that happens because we're not being obedient and telling people to pray for us, and God is so concerned that he will still stoop down and deal with us even in the midst of our disobedience. And we'll do so in a miraculous way because of his deep love for us. But generally, you need to tell people. And generally, most of us don't have an ongoing active gift of healing. And so we pray, and it's God that gets the glory. And even if we did have some gifting like that, guess what? Who gave us that gift? God. So who gets the glory? God. Every single time. Now, for the Jewish culture, they understood what this oil was about. For us... We might remember there is an instance in oil in, in Matthew, or I'm sorry, in the Gospels. I believe it's in Matthew, but I don't have the verse written down, so if I'm not, be a good Berean and look that up, where Jesus was anointed with oil. Uh, th- there's different times, but what they are thinking of is things like the oil in the Old Testament. Think about little David, right? And I'm, I, when I say little David, I mean when he was little and also that he was little, right? He was, not, he was the runt of the litter. He was not the top dog. And so when Samuel was told to go and anoint David... The anointing that he did was actually the same anointing that was used for a priest, and it symbolized something very clearly. It symbolized the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the person. And so, you know, Samuel went to David's dad and said, hey, uh, I've been told to, to anoint one of your boys. Where is he? Is it this one? And they go through all the boys. Surely have another kid. God says it's no to each one of those. Oh, it's the ruddy kid out in the field. He's, he's the last kid. He's the run of the litter, but surely you don't mean him. Things are done by the firstborn son. Oh, no, let's bring him out and see. This is the one. At the time, David did not know that that was an anointing to be king, right? I, I think that's an important thing to remember because it doesn't spe- explicitly say that. And the anointing that was used was one that was prescribed for priests, but he wasn't even in the priestly line, and yet God anointed him. And I, I say all that to connect you with this. We are a royal priesthood, so God should be anointing each of us, right? And, it, and it's certainly God who's doing the healing, so we should obediently follow through with the symbol of God's healing the way he intended. And that's absolutely true. But don't, don't make it a sideshow. Don't, don't overemphasize what God is using to heal somebody. And I've seen that, you know, we see these overemphasis on, on this particular oil or on these prayer cloths or look at this big tent revival. And some of that stuff becomes a show and you focus on the gifts and not the giver. Please don't make that error. But he did. He encouraged them to let people know, and then pray. But he says that a prayer of a righteous man availeth. And and I do know what that means. It it matters. It does something. But it is a weird word. 
right? But it matters. The prayer of a righteous man affects much. It has a big effect. And I know that you probably think of this first, and that's why you call somebody else that you know of in your life that is, that is holy and walking a good life, and you, you want them to pray for you. And that, that's, that's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. We should pray one for another. But as I read this, something different came and struck my mind. Because I, I often tell people, hey, whoa, you know, it's not like my prayers, if I say them and use more Bible verses, are more important than your prayers. Or if, I, if I'm a little more eloquent in the way I say a prayer, which is probably not the case because I'm a hillbilly, but if I do that, it's not that my prayer is more powerful. It's the person that we're praying to that's most important. And that righteousness, well, how is a Christian righteous? We have borrowed robes of righteousness. It is Jesus' righteousness. Chuck mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. When a Jewish follower was learning from a Jewish rabbi, a teacher, they would walk so close to him that they would want to get the dust that was kicked up out of his feet on, on themselves. They wanted the, the dust off of the master's feet. They wanted to be that close. As I thought about this passage of Scripture, and as I thought about the tragedy I, I was able to go to this week and be with the family as they endured their house, and thankfully Austin, uh, the eldest boy, was saved. Actually, a neighbor had to bust through a window. As I thought about that, and as I thought about my own kids, I thought about being ready to pray. Because the reality is that each of you, people know that you go to church, people know that you are a Christian if you're walking in God, and people will lean to you, even if they're not currently in church, or maybe if they don't even know if God is real or not, they're not confident, they still will go to you. I've had people ask me that I know are not living a right life. When something happens, they come running and they want some prayer. And if I love them, and God and I have a relationship, I don't want there to be any garbage that would slow me down from getting that prayer there. Kind of like a relationship with a spouse. Sometimes there's a fight going on, and, and there's, or maybe even there's some distance, and the distance needs to be addressed because there's some things that are not talked about. There's baggage, we might call it, and garbage going on. The Bible also talks about not only sin, but weights, things that might weigh us down. And so I want, as I looked at my kids this week, as I thought about them, I don't want a tragedy to happen. But if a tragedy does, I want to be walking so close to my rabbi, to Jesus, that I'm tapping on on his shoulder instantly, that I'm right there, that there's nothing I need to confess, that there's no problems going on, that I've been watching my mouth, watching my mind, keeping every thought captive, that I'm checking myself, and that I'm walking with him so that I have the wisdom to pray appropriately, so that I know he's right there and we're close. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to, to make you feel like you have to be legalistic, because thankfully there is grace and there is mercy. But what I am saying is, if you really love the people around you, one of the best ways that you can love the people around you is to be as close to Jesus as you possibly can. Because in him, you have the access to the great physician and the mighty counselor. And I know that there are times when I cannot fix the pain in somebody else's life. I'd really love to. But the closer I am to Jesus, the closer I can connect them to Jesus. And I want to be able to do that in the most effective way possible. And I hope that's your desire too. So if I can't encourage you to live as holy as possible for yourself, this is a weird encouragement. Can I encourage you to pursue Jesus as much as possible and to live as holy as possible because you love some of those people around you and know that you are their connection point to Jesus right now. You want to get them to their having their own connection point, but right now, they might not know Christ yet. And it's through you, you might be the only, as James, a living epistle. You might be the only epistle that they would read. And then he closes like this. My brethren, again, saying brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways, or way, will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Psalm 27, 6, and I'm going to close with this. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Do you love people enough to tell them the truth? Today in our society, we love people by tolerating them. That's not really love. I don't really love my kid if I tolerate his desire to lick his finger and stick it in an electrical plug. That's not real love. Just because I'm letting him do what he wants. That's apathy. Do you love people enough to tell them when they're going off the rails? And can we do that for one another so that we, as pilgrims, continue our journey, even when this life is a little crazy, towards our eternal home? Let's pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your word, and I, I thank you, and I think so many others do too. There's just a, a bluntness and a directness in James that sometimes we need in our society where politeness is, is confused with apathy, or love is confused with apathy. Very different things, but silence is not often love. And so, Lord, help us to encourage one another. Help us to address things. Help us to continue to be honest, but help us to do it as ambassadors, as good representers of you, that we could be tactical, that we could be gentle and meek, that our love would shine through, but never let us hide the truth in the idea that is somehow opposed to love, because those two things go together. Thank you for all the lessons that we've learned in James. Help us to remember them as we need them throughout this week and for the rest of our lives until we meet you again. In Jesus' name. Thank you.